Welcome to today's program titled ADA Title III Disability Access, Hot Issues and Litigation Trends in the Food and Beverage Industry. At this time, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those of you who are logged into the web presentation, you are encouraged to submit questions throughout the conference by typing them into the Q&A box on the right-hand side of your screen. For those interested in obtaining CLE credit for this webinar, an attendance verification code will be read during the presentation that will be required on the CLE attendance affirmation form. Please write this code down as it will not be reread and it is required for CLE credit. Copies of the webinar recording and materials along with the CLE attendance form will be distributed to attendees in the days following the webinar. On the next slide, you will see a legal disclaimer. At this time, I would like to turn it over to our first speaker for today's program, John Egan. John, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Kate. So uh, welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, good afternoon and good morning to our colleagues uh, and friends on the West Coast. My name is John Egan. I am a partner at the law firm Seifarth Shaw. I'm based in the uh, New York City office. Um, I am one of the leaders of the ADA Title III team, um, and I am the co-chair of our firm's uh, food and beverage uh, practice group. I'm joined uh, by my colleagues, Julia Sarnoff and Ashley Jenkins, who uh, you see on your screen, both are, like me, um, specialists who practice, practice exclusively in the disability access space. Um, and uh, we are just so uh, uh, pleased to have the opportunity to spend the next hour with you um, to cover our, our topic, which, as you could tell from the title, is uh, food and, food and beverage-centric, uh, uh, but not food and beverage-exclusive. Um, there's no kind of uh, separate body of law for food and beverage issues in ADA Title III, but there are certainly themes of particular import um, to your industry, and our program is going to have a uh, heavy emphasis on those issues, as well as specific cases um, that have arisen in the disability access space involving food and beverage providers, be they uh, restaurants or uh, uh, retail stores that offer food and beverage, uh, or whether they be um, manufacturers. Uh, of food and beverage products that advertise uh, their goods and services online. All right, so we're going to cover a lot uh, in a pretty short period of time. We only have 60 minutes. We could do hours and hours, but you don't want to hear us talk for hours and hours, right? So we're going to be pretty quick and to the point. Um, we're going to tell you basically what you need to know about the most recent developments uh, in this space. If you want to learn more, uh, we would absolutely encourage you to sign up for our blog, the ADA News and Insights blog, and that's at uh, ADAtitle3iii.com. It's a great URL, uh, which all three presenters uh, put a lot of time into in terms of uh, adding content and keeping our readers abreast of uh, all of the uh, uh, pertinent, salient, timely issues. So the disclaimer, go over it again. This isn't legal advice. This is a CLE. I'll be reading a code later on, so stay tuned uh, for, for that. Uh, this is what we all look like uh, again, and this is what we're going to cover today. Uh, we're going to first give you the where did this come from discussion, where uh, it, did all these requirements come from in ADA Title III, give you a high-level uh, overview of that in the various buckets of ADA Title III obligation. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, the national lawsuit numbers and hotspot jurisdictions. This is uh, one of the kind of defining features of our blog. We spent a lot of time looking at these issues um, and pub publishing them twice a year on our blog. We're going to talk about that with specific emphasis on some really interesting um, mid-year statistics that we're seeing in 2022. We're going to discuss effective communication, the obligation that public accommodations have to communicate effectively uh, with individuals with perceptive disabilities, disabilities of sight, hearing, of speech, um, which leads nicely into our discussion of website and mobile app accessibility, the hottest topic um, in the ADA Title III space that's evolving uh, on a weekly, monthly basis, and we're going to get you up to speed on all those uh, most recent updates. Also, we're going to cover kiosks and some forthcoming rulemaking that we may see in that space, um, particularly of import to food and beverage providers that are using kiosks 
particularly in the, in the context of the pandemic, to maybe avoid as many in-person interactions. We're going to talk about key disability access cases and themes. Um, we're going to go over a lot of cases, but we're going to try to tell you what you need to know about them and why they're important. Um, then, kind of wrapping up, uh, we're going to talk about risk mitigation strategies for digital access, kind of the big picture best practices that you should walk away from this presentation with on the ever-evolving, ever-challenging website accessibility and digital accessibility space. And finally, uh, we're going to talk about physical accessibility. Really important for a lot of you, uh, but not necessarily something where we're seeing developments of the same nature and, and frequency as in the digital space. So we're going to give it kind of short shrift. Um, but there are thousands of requirements that you need to be aware of, and thousands of cases are being filed. Um, but we're going to give you kind of our best practices um, as our kind of concluding, concluding uh, subtopic. Okay? So that's, that's the agenda. We've got a lot to do. Uh, let's uh, head off and start it off uh, with the overview. And I'm going to kick it over to my colleague, Ashley, for that. Thanks, John. So like John said, we're going to discuss why we're here. The foundation of the prohibition of discrimination against people with disabilities is the Americans with Disabilities Act. The ADA was signed into law in July 1990, which is a significant date for our later discussions on website accessibility. If you'll remember, the web was not even around in 1990. Thus, there are lots of discussions currently about how that statutory language of the ADA should be applied to websites. Our focus today is Title III, which concerns places of public accommodation. One of the most discussed aspects of the ADA is whether a business is even a place of public accommodation subject to the requirements of the ADA. The ADA sets out 12 categories of businesses that are covered by the ADA, including not limited to restaurants and places of lodging, which is important to our conversation today. The ADA requires four things of public accommodations. That public accommodations have accessible facilities, so physical spaces, that those facilities are maintained, that the public accommodation makes reasonable modifications to policies, practices, and procedures when necessary to ensure people with disabilities have equal access to the public accommodations, goods, services, and facilities. Finally, the public accommodation must ensure effective communication with people with disabilities by providing auxiliary aids and services at no additional charge. Finally, something to keep in mind is that some states, such as California and New York, have their own non-discrimination laws. Also, some cities, such as New York City, do it does as well. Next slide. So what happens if a public accommodation violates the ADA? What are the potential consequences? First, if an individual brings the lawsuit, that individual can receive an order from a court requiring that the barrier be fixed or remediated. That's the injunctive relief. Plaintiffs can also receive attorney's fees and costs. And if the suit is brought under a state law, such as under New York or in California, the plaintiff can possibly recover monetary damages. If the Department of Justice brings an enforcement action against a public accommodation, it can recover penalties in the amounts shown on this slide, plus the injunctive relief discussed before. The penalties are just over 97,000 for the first violation and just over 195,000 for a subsequent violation. These amounts are raised every few years and were just recently increased at the end of 2021. Next slide. No, you're on mute. I'm going to unmute myself and talk to you guys about national lawsuit <laughs> today. Sorry, guys. Please, next slide. <laughs> I'm sure it was great, whatever you said. It was. You have to say it again. <laughs> so, this, this slide is a chart that shows you the filing statistics for ADA Title III lawsuits filed in federal courts between 2013 and 2021. The short story is that the number of ADA Title III lawsuits filed, and this covers all types of ADA Title III suits, whether websites, physical accessibility, service animals, reasonable modifications, there was explosive growth over the past eight years um, with a peak in 2021. <clears throat> Next slide, please. The interesting thing that we have found, and as John said at the beginning of the presentation, we as a firm track lawsuit 
filings in federal courts um, is that 2022 mid-year has shown a decrease in the number of federal ADA Title III lawsuits filed. Um, it's actually an astonishing 22% decrease. Um, and we're wondering, okay, why is this? Um, and in part, if you go to the next slide, you'll see some context. So as you'll see here in 2022 mid-year, the state with the highest number of ADA Title III lawsuits filed is New York, with California coming in second, followed by Florida, Texas, and Pennsylvania. This is very interesting because it's actually the first year since we started tracking these numbers that New York has come in first. Um, and the reason for that, in part at least, because one plaintiff's firm based in New York called Ms. Rocky Krube has been filing more than a thousand website accessibility lawsuits in the Southern District of New York specifically. Um, they're targeting mid-size and even smaller size businesses as opposed to the really big businesses. So you guys probably may have heard or been even subject to some of these lawsuits. Um, and the reduction in California numbers is probably due to some enforcement activity with regards to some um, very uh, active plaintiffs firms, um, specifically the Center for Disability Access um, that is being investigated for potential fraudulent activity um, and other activity with regard to another um, San Francisco-based firm. Um, and those enforcement activities against those plaintiff's law firms likely have had a chilling effect on the plaintiff's bar in California and elsewhere, which has resulted in a, a fewer number of lawsuits being filed in California and then resulting in the lower numbers overall. All right, we're up to me. We are. All right, so one quick point too about the, the statistics. You'll notice that uh, Julie was talking about federal filings as opposed to state filings. We don't track those uh, because they're much more difficult to track. Um, we use courthouse news essentially to track federal filings. We don't have the same ability in state court, but you know the bottom line is that probably more <laughs> California activity in state court that you don't um, see on this slide. Um, and also, of course, we don't uh, account for the demand letters uh, that go out, um, particularly in the website and mobile app space. And so that's just another kind of um, texture uh, when you look at that slide. All right, effective communication, uh, that's me. Uh, we talked about this kind of briefly, uh, and we'll go back into it uh, a bit. Effective communication is, as I said earlier, and as I actually touched on, the obligation to essentially communicate uh, in alternative formats for those with uh, disabilities of sight, hearing, uh, and in some cases, speech, right? So it's the obligation that you, uh, uh, that the business identifies an alternative method or alternative format um, to communicate in a manner that is perceivable and effective. There are some exceptions. Um, there is no obligation to fundamentally alter the way you do business. So in other words, it's about communicating services and goods effectively or about services and goods effectively, not about modifying what those services or goods are. And there's also a defense for undue hardship. So in a lot of ways, this analysis kind of reminds me of the reasonable accommodation framework under ADA Title I applicable to the employment context. There is an element of reasonableness to this, and ultimately the business has the ultimate decision to select what uh, form uh, of alternative presentation uh, will be provided so long as that it's effective, so long that it's timely, so long that it's free of charge, all right? Uh, and there's another important complex, uh, complexion to this as well, and that is what the, na the nature of the appropriate method of communication depends on context. So it depends on the importance of the communication for the individual. It depends upon what's being discussed. A discussion with your doctor in a hospital about potentially life-saving treatment, okay, uh, if you're deaf, uh, probably may require uh, uh, an ASL interpreter, okay, or other complex means. But a simple retail transaction may be appropriate to exchange notes or to gesture with somebody who is deaf as by way of example, okay? And also, if what's being requested, and the business has the obligation to consider what's being requested uh, by the individual, um, if that's not, if that 
qualifies as an undue hardship, um, which is a pretty difficult standard to meet for a lot of businesses that are well-resourced. But if it is an undue hardship, then the business isn't off the hook. Um, it has to consider alternative methods of providing access that would not constitute an, our, an undue hardship. So you could see it's kind of similar, kind of similar to the Title I kind of framework. All right, examples. Uh, again, so if you're thinking, all right, this is a deaf person, it's got to be visual, um, or in some cases, tactile, like Braille. Um, if the person has a visual disability, then it needs to be audible. So, for example, a person in a restaurant asks for the, the, uh, the menu to be read. Um, you know, that would be an example of effective communication if the server went ahead and did it. In a lot of contexts, putting this complex digital accessibility stuff aside, um, a lot of times effective communication can be done by uh, a good customer service, good customer service. Um, you know, you, you see a person on the street who has a need, uh, you know, most of us are going to try to help that individual. And so your personnel, uh, when dealing with and servicing people with, uh, you know, visual disabilities and auditory disabilities, you know, being helpful, offering assistance, um, in most cases is going to solve that problem and may forestall a larger issue, whether it be a lawsuit um, or uh, an enforcement uh, action. All right, so how do you know what auxiliary aids, uh, aids and services to provide? We talked about this. It has to protect the privacy and the independence of the person with the disability. Um, it has to be fact sensitive in terms of the complexity of the communication. Um, you have to consider the individual's preferred method. Um, it extends to companions. Um, so if that request comes in from a family member, uh, then you have to consider it. You can't just rely on a family member, though, to interpret. Uh, that's a no-no uh, uh, and, to, and to basically translate. Um, and you can't shift the cost to the individual with a disability. So that's effective communication in a nutshell. Let's talk about websites. All right, so that's me. Next slide, please. Okay. All right, so unlike the physical accessibility standards of the ADA that provide specifications, often down to half an inch, on the placement or lo and location of certain elements in a physical space, we don't have the same type of standards for websites written into the ADA. So even though there is not a regulation about how a website must be coded in order to be deemed accessible and in compliance with Title III, the general non-discrimination principle that John was just talking about to provide effective communication applies to websites. So web websites must be accessible and usable by individuals with disabilities. For those of you who are new to website accessibility, this slide discusses examples of how a website can be coded so that it is accessible. What that means is that the website is coded so that a screen reader can use it, a screen reader user can use it to interact with the website. Individuals who are blind use screen readers to assist them decipher what is on the website. And the vast majority of the lawsuits we see are by individuals who are blind. Next slide. So how do businesses know how to make their website accessible if we don't have something written into the ADA? What guidance is there? Well, while there is no standard for website accessibility under Title III, the Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, commonly referred to as WCAG, is the de facto standard. WCAG is a set of guidelines published by a private group of experts called the W3C. We are currently in version 2.1 of these guidelines, Although version 2.0 is still considered the prevailing standard, mainly because it has been cited in so many consent decrees since the Obama DOJ, as well as many private advocacy agreements. And while 2.1 is out, a lot of companies are moving towards that way, and 2.1 only has 17 additional success criteria added to 2.0. Now, there are also three levels of compliance of, with WCAG, A, AA, and AAA. And generally, companies strive to be either A or AA compliant so that they can be considered accessible. Next slide. So the next question you should have is, will we ever see website accessibility guidelines and regulations? And as you'll see on this slide, we have been waiting for over 10 years. So this is the overview. The Obama DOJ out the advanced notice of proposed rulemaking back in 2010, and then the Trump DOJ pulled it back, basically ending any regulatory effort on that. However, in February of this year, we saw a little bit of movement. It started with 181 advocacy groups, which joined in one letter 
asking the DOJ to come up with website accessibility standards by the end of the Biden administration. And then the next month in March, lo and behold, the DOJ issued some website accessibility guidance. As you see on the slide, the, the key points to take away from it, unfortunately, us as practitioners didn't find it too entirely useful, but it is something. And it does reference WCAG 2.0, AA is a quote de facto standard. And then finally, earlier this year, we received notice from the DOJ that in August, which is right now, we might be seeing an advance notice of proposed rulemaking regarding fixed service self-service kiosks that John was mentioning. However, it's halfway through the month and we have not seen anything from the DOJ. John? Right, right. And just to jump in real quick on this. So, so yeah, I mean, you know, the DOJ uh, uh, guidance document, you know, was labeled guidance. Um, but in a lot of ways, it just kind of restated what we already know. Um, it had some helpful stuff in there about how businesses have flexibility to comply um, with the ADA as it relates to websites, um, but it didn't conclusively answer some of the questions that we'll be raising during this presentation. Um, but it did reference consent decree settlements where DOJ um, basically started enforcement proceedings against private businesses. Um, and under the consent decree settlements, they agreed to conform their websites to uh, to WCAG, uh, WCAG 2.0 AA, all right, as opposed to 2.1, which is the most recent iteration um, of those standards. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out too about this, which did make it into the slide because it's like so new, um, but three weeks ago, DOJ announced that in I think it's April uh, of next year they're going to be issuing an NPRM, a Notice of Proposed Rulemaking, um, for website accessibility regulations applicable to state and local governments under ADA Title II. So why do you care? Why does this matter to you? It does matter to you, I think, um, because in many ways, assuming that this actually goes forward and there are website accessibility regulations for state and local governments, they very well may form the template um, for any future rulemaking for ADA Title III applicable to places of public accommodation. And so it's a big deal um, if the DOJ comes out with regulations on website accessibility, even relating to um, state and local governments. There's a lot of questions that we need answers to. What are you going to do about third-party content? What are you going to do about small businesses or entities or organizations that are under-resourced? What are you going to do about the period of time to comply? And what happens to the lawsuits during the interim period. So, you know, this may well form kind of a basis for how we look at Title III uh, regulations when they issue. And so this is our kind of pitch to you if you work for a business that's been sued a lot over websites or if you're part of an industry, gr industry group, um, it may be well worth your time to think about putting in some comments next year on the proposed regulations for state and local governments to start kind of articulating what these concerns are. Because the advocacy organization folks, they're, they're well organized. They're well organized, and sometimes the business community isn't quite isn't quite that way, um, and so we need to kind of mobilize on this. All right, so that's my pitch. Uh, onward and upward. All right, so I'm going to talk to you guys about how, given the lack of DOJ regulations, courts have been left with the unenviable task of interpreting how the ADA applies to websites. And the fact is there have been wide ranging results, depending on which jurisdiction is hearing the case or deciding the issue. Um, so we're going to talk about the key cases and themes that have come out of this body of case law. Um, and starting with number one, um, can a web only business be considered subject to the ADA um, or does it have to have a physical nexus to a brick and mortar location to be subject to the ADA? Federal courts disagree on this point. They disagree on whether web only businesses are covered as public accommodations. Um, point number two, if you entered into a settlement agreement and you agreed to make your website accessible and you get sued again. Can't you use that to say, hey, I already agreed to do this. I already agreed to make my website accessible. And so there's no injunctive relief to be had by the plaintiff. Unfortunately, most courts have said no, the settlement agreement, a private settlement agreement is between two private parties and it isn't a court order. And so you can get sued again, even if you've agreed to make your website accessible in a private agreement. Point number three. Um, if you're interested in the process of making your website accessible, usually that will not moot your case because, you know, you've still got existing inaccessibility on your site. Um, if you have completed 
um, the work on your site. If your site is now accessible, but you got sued, you know, maybe when you were in the late stages of fixing your site, that may be a good argument. That may be a very good argument for mooting the case out and getting it dismissed. Um, point number four, if a plaintiff can't ever use the services of the business that has an inaccessible website, the case can be dismissed for lack of standing. Um, this is something that has come up in the credit union context. Um, if a plaintiff says, oh, a credit union's website is inaccessible, but the plaintiff couldn't actually be a member of the credit union, then they don't have standing to sue that credit union. Um, and point number five, we are in this mess of case law that we're gonna talk about in this presentation because most cases settle. Frankly, um, those that have been litigated often are litigated in the context of an early motion to dismiss um, for a lack of standing to sue. Um, and as a result, we have only a few cases that have been litigated to judgment and litigated on the merits. And we'll talk about those in this presentation. Next slide, please. Okay, so let's start with our websites themselves covered by the ADA. As Ashley said earlier in the presentation, you know, the ADA was written before the internet existed. So it doesn't reference specifically whether websites are covered. The, the answer is it depends on what circuit you're in. The 11th circuit says no, but if a business has a website and um, the website barriers prevent access to the actual physical place, that's a violation of the ADA. Ninth circuit says no. Um, if there's no physical place of business, if you're an online only retailer, then the website is not covered by the ADA. The third circuit has not considered the issue in the context of a website case, but it has held that a public accommodation must actually be a physical place. So we think maybe they would go the same route as the ninth circuit. Um, the first circuit also is not considered a website case, but um, has held that a public accommodation does not have to be a physical place. So that's different from the third circuit. And the second circuit is a mess, frankly. Um, while the second circuit itself hasn't ruled on a website case, district courts in the Eastern, Southern, Northern, and Western districts actually have reached differing conclusions on whether internet only businesses are covered. And we'll talk about that on the next slide. Actually in two slides, because first we have breaking news for you guys. And this is breaking news actually in California, where um, historically we have seen so many website accessibility lawsuits filed, both in the federal side of things in the district courts, as well as in California state courts, and also lots and lots of demand letters, um, in part because there's the UNRU Civil Rights Act in California, where plaintiffs, if, if they win a case, are entitled to $4,000 statutory damages for each violation. Um, it makes it a very appealing place for plaintiffs to file lawsuits or to sit in demand letters. Um, how, and there was a di disparity amongst, depending on which state court judge you had for a while there in California, as to whether a web-only business was uh, subject to the ADA. But just earlier this month, on August 1st, the California Court of Appeals affirmed a judgment of dismissal against an online-only retailer. The Court of Appeals said online-only businesses are not places of public accommodation. And importantly, they also said that um, the UNRU Act, which again is California's state corollary statute to the ADA that provides for these damages, they said that creating and maintaining an inaccessible website does not constitute what is intentional discrimination under the UNRU Act that would then entitle a plaintiff to um, damages even beyond the $4,000 damage, statutory damages, um, which is very good news. It, even if, as in this case, the plaintiff informed the business that their website had issues, that the website wasn't fully accessible. If the business does not fix the website in accordance with those complaints, it's still not intentional discrimination. And that's something that's gonna be important moving forward um, in this body of law. Um, key takeaways from this case. This decision will certainly, almost certainly reduce the number of lawsuits brought in California state and federal courts um, because they're not gonna be uh, there's the issue, of course, on the only retailers and also the UNRU Act interpretation. Um, if you have a brick and mortar space, if you have a restaurant or a bar um, that's in California and you have a website that's connected to that, the, uh, the interpretation of law here may not apply to you, except it's in the context of the UNRU Act, where a plaintiff can't say, oh, you intentionally discriminated against me because you don't have an accessible website. So it's a good decision, really, no matter what, what position you're in. Next slide, please. Yeah, and just, just if I could quickly just add to that, Julie, if it's okay. Um, 
you know, it, it's really a remarkable decision because, you know, what the court does is it goes through uh, the appellate court, um, goes through some of the consideration um, by Congress going back to like 2005, 2006 on whether to regulate websites as part of the ADA. In 2008, the ADA was amended under the ADA Amendments Act to expand the definition of what a disability is. Um, in response to some court decisions that in the interpretation of Congress or the judgment of Congress too narrowly construed that threshold requirement to show that you're disabled under the ADA. Um, but they considered, the court shone a light on this, they considered whether around two years before that whether to apply the ADA to websites. And there was testimony by a subcommittee that uh, one expert testified that uh, in his or her assessment, 98%, 98%, of commercial websites are inaccessible. And the court looked at that and said, you know, Congress heard that testimony and then elected not to, not to amend the ADA on, the, on that basis. Um, in a similar vein, the court pointed out that, you know, DOJ um, was in a position to issue regulations for years and was obviously aware that these lawsuits have been filed en masse and create, uh, uh, you know, confusion has been created and chose not to act. And so basically the court you know, from an interpretation standpoint, from a construction standpoint, use those data points as a, uh, or a rationale um, to reason that it wasn't appropriate for them to step in and clarify this issue of whether, um, uh, you know, this ambiguous issue of whether a website itself is a place of public accommodation. And so by extension, it kind of raises interesting questions in terms of how courts are going to construe um, legislative and regulatory inaction and whether they're willing to kind of wade into this and provide clarity where the institutions that are really in the best position to evaluate these issues, weigh the costs, weigh the benefits, weigh the burdens, weigh the policy, are choosing electively not to act until maybe next year. Uh, we'll see. But it's a really interesting decision, so I want to make that point. Sorry, Julia, back to you. <laughs> All right, so let's talk very briefly about the New York District Court split on whether or not a website is covered by the ADA if it doesn't have um, a nexus to a physical place of business. Um, the Eastern District of New York has had a couple of decisions holding that websites are not a place of public accommodation on their own. However, the Southern District, Western District, and Northern District of New York have all issued decisions, you know, depending on your judge, holding that a website is in fact a place of public accommodation. The most recent decision just came out um, six days ago in Walters versus Walters versus Fisher Skis US LLC. Um, that was an online retailer of ski equipment and ski clothing. Um, they sell like a few things of their own products on their website, but mostly sell stuff through other people's websites. And the judge still found that they are covered by ADA Title III. So New York is becoming kind of an increasingly unfriendly place for web only businesses. Next slide. Okay, that's back to me. So, all right. So, if you're if you work for uh, a brick and mortar business, you're probably saying like, why am I, why am I listening to this ADA only discussion? So, you know, take heart. Uh, we're now moving to the next kind of phase of this. We're talking about merits decisions, um, important merits decisions, um, and recent merits decisions on whether, how, and to what extent um, the ADA applies, including to businesses that actually have. Uh, a brick and mortar presence. And so possibly the most famous case um, is Robles v. Domino's, which was settled just a few months ago after a number of years of intensive um, litigation. And really uh, what to know about the case is that, you know, the Ninth Circuit essentially shot down uh, many of the arguments that defense practitioners, none <laughs> on this presentation, but defense practitioners advanced uh, when uh, website accessibility was becoming a thing in the courts, that being this is a violation of due process, it needs to await website regulation, uh, web, website regulations and then formal activities by the DOJ, arguments that under primary jurisdiction doctrine, the case can't proceed and should be stayed essentially until uh, you know, we understand from the agency what they expect. And so the Ninth Circuit shot those arguments um, down um, and remanded the case uh, back to the district court um, for determination as to whether the website, uh, in fact, complied with the ADA. Um, and I think where we are now, uh, maybe that remand decision is even more interesting. Uh, because what the, basically what the court held 
was that that business was not providing an accessible website, um, was in violation um, of the ADA, uh, and basically ordered uh, the court to uh, ordered the defendant to 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 comply with WCAG. Now, uh, some interesting kind of tidbits about the facts: the defense own expert um, testified that he could not, with a screen reader, make a future order. Uh, for a pizza or any kind of related food items that Domino's was selling. So he testified that the app worked for him uh, on with the screen reader, but the website didn't. Okay. And so, you know, we're talking about, and I'm sure you're dealing with, you know, these wave reports, these automated scanning reports with your 4,000 violations, right? But here the problem was more elemental. Um, from a use case perspective, somebody couldn't make an order. All right. And the court focused on that from the defense's own um, admitted testimony. The other uh, issue that comes up is this question of telephone access as an alternative. Because we talked earlier about effective communication and the flexibility that you as the business have in terms of, uh, of what method to use. And so question that comes up all the time. In fact, it's a question that DOG raised back in 2010 when it issued its very first ANPRM on website accessibility. Is a 24-7 telephone line an acceptable alternative to an accessible website? Domino's made that argument. Um, court said no, because that telephone number, all right, uh, was evaluated by the plaintiff. The plaintiff testified undisputably that, undisputedly, uh, that he tried to make a, a, an order on two occasions over the telephone line and had to wait uh, 45 minutes, all right? So the court focused on that and said, that's not equivalent uh, under the ADA. That's not compliant um, with the ADA. So Robles v. Domino's. More decisions on the merits, and this actually kind of corrects an earlier slide. Julia talked about an earlier slide, which would be the 11th Circuit uh, requirement. So we're going to talk a little bit about in detail about how this kind of changes the landscape. Gil v. Winn-Dixie, maybe the second most famous um, website accessibility case. Um, essentially, one of the only uh, trials uh, that we're aware of that went to verdict in website accessibility um, and ended up uh, favorable for the plaintiff. The plaintiff won, got a sweeping injunction. WACAG conformance the court ordered, training the court ordered, um, third-party compliance in terms of third-party content on the website uh, the court ordered, and fees in the amount of six figures, all right? Goes up to the 11th Circuit, court reverses the trial court decision, holds that the website's not even covered. This is a website with a brick-and-mortar presence, right? Um, court says no. The website, in order to be covered, has to form an intangible barrier to access to goods and services offered um, at, you know, the physical store. Um, so basically, uh, and interestingly, um, you basically have a situation where a court reverses the district court order. But then, and this is like a really crazy twist, um, there's an application for rehearing on banc, um, and the 11th Circuit essentially – uh, uh, vacates all of it, pointing to the fact that the injunction uh, had expired during the pendency of the appeal. So the injunction was not stayed. The injunction expired. And so the underlying, uh, the, the, basically the appellate decision was then vacated. All right. So you still have, and Julie can talk about this, the Haynes v. Dunkin' Donuts case in the 11th Circuit, which still kind of speaks to the same proposition. But in terms of Gil v. Winn-Dixie, it kind of is tabula rasa uh, based on the courts essentially holding that all of it was moot based on the, uh, the, the ex expiration uh, of the injunction. All right. Thurston v. Uh, Midvale, this is another merits decision and a really bad one. Uh, for the business. Uh, business is a, a, a L.A. restaurant named uh, the Whisper Lounge, which unsurprisingly is no longer in business after this saga. Um, but essentially uh, what happened was uh, the court ordered on summary judgment, uh, the district court ordered on summary judgment uh, that the plaintiff prevailed um, in establishing that the website is not accessible. Um, broadly issued an injunction to conform the website to WACAG level uh, 2.0 AA, um, and ordered the defendant to pay $4,000 uh, in statutory damages. Uh, that decision was affirmed uh, on appeal. And this was, again, state court, not federal court in California, <laughs> uh, holding that, you know, it's covered because there's a, there's a nexus between the site, uh, between the website 
uh, and a physical place of business. Um, and interestingly, addressing this question of third-party content. This is an example, I think, of how sometimes bad arguments make, make bad law. The defendant basically said, well, listen, if you look at this journey uh, to make a reservation uh, on our restaurant's website, you have to go outside uh, of our, our restaurant's URL. You have to go to, I think maybe it was Open Table, to make a mm -hmm. reservation. And so we're not responsible for Open Table. So what the court basically said was, listen, you can't rely on uh, other instrumentalities, kind of relying on an ADA or bringing in kind of an ADA concept in this Unruh Act issue. Um, you can't rely on other instrumentalities to effect discrimination. And so essentially, even though the business didn't have control over that third party entity, it was still part of that process to make a reservation to the hotel. So the court then essentially is saying that there's some obligation um, on the business to be responsible for third party content even if that content is outside of the URL of the defendant, um, but was relevant, pertinent to doing a core function on the site, i.e. getting a reservation uh, to sit down uh, and have a meal. All right. So an example of a, of a pretty unfavorable aspect of the case, particularly for all of you uh, who are kind of struggling with what to do about your third party providers, which may not be responsive to your request that, you know, you make that they make their content. Uh, WCAG conformant for you um, so that you can have a more defensible website. Not a great decision. Also, uh, on the question of uh, telephone access, court said that doesn't cut it. Uh, telephone line doesn't cut it because you can learn about the, the, the restaurant on a 24-7 basis um, online. Um, but if you're cited and you're relying on a telephone number, then you can only call during normal business hours. Um, and so the court basically shot that you know, argument down as well in terms of uh, telephone as being an alternative method of providing uh, access to the website. Uh, Thurston v. Omni Hotels. Uh, this is another case out of California, but a favorable case uh, for businesses. It was not a website accessibility case. It was a hotel reservation case. Um, and specifically, and it does apply here, bear with me, um, but there are specific ADA regulations requiring that hotel websites produce certain information, have certain functionality on their websites. And so the claim was alleging that this hotel didn't do that. And it went all the way to trial, which is kind of remarkable. And at trial, uh, the defense attorney was able to get a jury instruction, which you see kind of uh, quoted over here, that essentially the plaintiff had to have a good faith intention uh, to actually go on the website for purposes of making a hotel reservation or, or you know, ascertaining the prices and the details necessarily to make uh, or consider whether to make a reservation. And essentially, that was the instruction to the jury. And the jury held, after listening to the plaintiff, that she didn't have any such good faith intent. Um, and on that basis, the defense uh, won a verdict uh, at jury trial. Uh, this isn't actually a standing issue. Um, it kind of seems like it's related to standing, but actually the way it was framed in the court was that it was uh, because this was actually a, uh, appealed where the defendant won on appeal, which was great for the defense. Um, but essentially, uh, it was actually an element of the claim uh, that an Unruh Act claim you needed to show this this bona fide good faith intention, and the plaintiff failed to do it. It's interesting because oftentimes we get you know these questions of like, is this a real plaintiff? the plaintiff really interested in going to my website as well as the 150 other sites that they sued. Um, and so it kind of raises that issue of like, if you really push that and you're willing to invest in that and pay the fees to pursue that, you know, you might have a good outcome. All right. Um, send it on over to Ashley. All right. And I'm going to continue what John just started the conversation on standing. So the first case I want to talk about is Calcano versus Swarovski. Some of you on here may have been aware of the Braille gift card lawsuits that were pending for a few years, starting in 2019. Well, two months ago, a consolidated case, the Swarovski case finally came to a decision. And in that case, the Second Circuit found that those plaintiffs had no standing because they could not show how they were injured by the unavailability of Braille gift cards. And they failed to specify any information about their prior visits that would support an inference that they intended to return to these businesses, but for the fact that there were no Braille gift cards. And another recent case is the Hardy case. 
we love the Hardy case here. <laughs> this case <laughs> is about uh, allegedly deficient accessibility information on a hotel reservations website. Like John was just discussing, there are specific rules and regulations about what needs to be on a website. And the Second Circuit affirmed the lower court's dismissal in this case, holding that there has to be some downstream consequences from failing to receive the required information. So since the plaintiff admitted to only visiting the website to determine compliance, not to actually reserve a room for the hotel, the court found that that plaintiff lacked standing because there was actually no intent to use the, the information that they were looking for, but for the fact that it wasn't there. So that's a great case that we can that we are using going forward. But in contrast, the 11th Circuit just came out with the Loeffler decision, the Loeffler decision. And in that one, the court found that a plaintiff who visited another hotel web reservation website that required, that supposedly lacked the required accessibility information, that, that plaintiff had, again, no intention of personally visiting the hotel, but was just visiting the website to determine the accuracy of the information. The court found that that plaintiff suffered humiliation, which resulted in a concrete and particularized injury sufficient to confer standing. So the humiliation and frustration from not being able to get the information that they were looking for was sufficient to confer standing. So not a great case, but again, shows the circuit split between the second circuit and the 11th circuit. Next slide. Oops, sorry, there you go. All right, so the next topic we're gonna talk about is can a business moot a website accessibility lawsuit? And that, you know, because right now the ADA provides for injunctive relief only. So if you can fix the barriers, can you make the lawsuit go away? These cases just are success stories. So we're gonna talk about four of these. First is the Diaz case, which is a New York case. And in this case, the defendant put a declaration in about the barriers being remediated and the plaintiff failed to file an opposition. So the court dismissed the case we see this case as an outlier. It was three years ago, and we don't think that this would happen again. Plaintiff's firms are, would definitely put in some type of opposing declaration. The next two Langer cases from California, these are both about captioning videos. These are success stories in our, in our view. Both of these cases involve videos that the defendant ended up captioning or either removing from their website. So the court uh, dismiss those cases based on mootness, mootness since there was no injunctive relief to be had. And the last case on this slide is the Rizzi case. This is a safe hearth case, so we're really proud of this one. It's a great example of a mootness argument in federal court. We submitted a declaration from a reputable consultant that a blind person was able to use the website. And because of that, the court dismissed the case. They found that the declaration was enough information to say that all the barriers have been remediated and that there was no injunctive relief to be had. All right, so let's flip the coin and look at the next slide. All right, so on the other side, these are cases where mootness arguments were not successful. First and last on this slide is the Yield Street and U.S. Wings cases. Both of these involved widgets, which if you have uh, had any uh, cases with us, you have heard our opinions on them. Yield Street was using the widget user way and US Wings used accessibility. Both of these defendants tried to prove mootness by informing the court of their use of these widgets, or, which they were told would help make their website accessible. And in both cases, the court found that there were still barriers and they did not find that there was, um, that they, they did not agree with the mootness argument and allowed the case to go forward. The next case, the Walters v. Skinny Ties, this is a considered a battle of the experts. Both sides, defense and plaintiff, put in conflicting testimony regarding whether or not the barriers were fixed because there was a question of fact that survived the motion to dismiss. And last is Haynes v. Hooters, another 11th Circuit case. As Julia brought up earlier in the, in the webinar, this, brought, this case was about a previous settlement agreement. So the defense in this case had a previous settlement agreement with a, a plaintiff, and there was a subsequent case on the same website. The defense wanted to say, hey, we have an agreement with another plaintiff to fix this website. We're currently in process of fixing these barriers. There should be no injunctive relief to be had because what else can you make us do? 
the court said that that's not good enough. You were still in process. It's not done. So mootness argument lost on that one as well. Julia? All right, next slide goes to me and I'm gonna to talk to you guys about kiosk litigation, which I know is probably a, a hot topic for you guys in the food and beverage industry, particularly with COVID. Um, you know, as John mentioned at the beginning of the presentation. Um, also, as we talked about before, we are really hoping that we'll get um, an ANPRM from DOJ on self-service kiosks um, this month, or at least sometime soon to provide clarity on how exactly kiosks are, and, you know, can comply with the ADA so that you can protect yourself from ADA lawsuits. Um, in the meantime, we can provide some, some, background on how we think, you know, DOJ and courts are going to interpret these issues. Um, well, really the, the big picture is if you have a self-service kiosk in your business, it had better either be accessible or your employees need to know and provide both prompt and effective assistance. Um, it has to be timely and it has to be very good. This is all about effective communication. Um, one, one um, DOJ matter where the DO, one case was DOJ issued a statement of interest. Um, it's a case about a self check in kiosk at a diagnostic lab. Um, the kiosks <clears throat> had an option where you could, with three fingers, swipe and be added um, to the waiting list. However, if you were cited, you could check in, insert your personal info, and indicate whether you already had a scheduled appointment, at which point you wouldn't be added to the end of the waiting list. You would actually just be registered for the appointment that you made, um, or you could be added to the wait list. If you were non-cited and you did three-finger swipe, you would automatically be added, added to the end of the wait list, even if you had a scheduled appointment. That is not equivalent service. If you have to wait and lose your priority in line when you had a scheduled um when you had a scheduled appointment so that's an example where um a kiosk likely would not be considered ada compliant and the service would not be equivalent um as a contrast to that there is a case that's nfb um, versus walmart um this had to do with self-checkout at walmart stores um and actually in this case Staff assistance was found to be effective and to be sufficient to provide effective communication in a retail transaction um, because the customer could independently input private information. They could put their PIN number in a tactile keypad and employees who were helping them were super diligent and provided really good timely assistance. So again, while we hope to get further clarification on kiosk issues from DOJ, in the meantime, just know if you, if you have a kiosk, ideally make it accessible. If you can't, make sure that your employees are providing really good, timely, effective service. Awesome, and that actually answered one of our questions. And I've been trying to answer questions that come in on a rolling basis, but keep them coming. Uh, all right. Risk mitigation strategies for digital accessibility. Oh, this is a big topic, and we don't have enough time to even kind of scratch the surface. But here are the highlights uh, of of uh, of kind of our our learnings on this issue. All right. So the law is, and this is a technical legal term, a mess in a lot of ways, right? The law is kind of a mess. It's all over the place. Is it moot? Is it not? Is it covered? Is it not? Right? But we do know some things. We know that the agency responsible for enforcing these laws, the DOJ, they happen to think website accessibility is important enough to bring enforcement actions, and they look to WACAG as, uh, as the applicable uh, standard. WACAG is really tough. It's an onion. It's a lot more complicated than I think a lot of people at DOJ realize. Okay? So, but the bottom line is that in a lot of cases, that really needs to be your target um, because that's what we have. Um, flexibility, we think so. Uh, it's going to have to be fleshed out in regulations and or case law or both. Um, but what's, what's your target? Is your target WACAG 2.0, 2.1, double A? Single A really is really basic. Triple A was never intended to be a standard. Probably should be 2.0 or 2.1 double A. So you have to pick a target. Um, training. You know, your success rises and falls um, in the way of buy-in. Are your developers really bought into this? Or is it the question of kind of like, you know, uh, you know, do you have goldfish memory? Every 10 seconds, you bring a lawsuit, you know, you focus on it, you know, goldfish, 10 seconds, right? They, they forget after 10 seconds. 
and then the lawsuit's gone, and then we forget about everything we learned about website accessibility, the audit goes out the window, and you know, now we're basically starting all over again when the next case comes. So you can't have goldfish memory. You have to have institutional memory. You got to think about where you're going to place this responsibility. And if one person leaves, um, that knowledge can't leave with her. All right. Accessibility statements are all the rage. Be careful with them. Make sure they're accurate. Um, a lot of times consultants are selling them. A lot of times that they're not actually matching up with what you're actually doing. So that's a problem. And it's potential evidence in the case of a, of a litigation down the road. So be careful with accessibility statements. Um, vendor contracts, we talked about third-party issues. Are you expecting your vendors to be partners in this? Are they going to get you sued with what they're providing? You know, how do you have that conversation? Um, how do you create... Um, an expectation contractually or from a relationship business perspective, or ideally both, that they're actually going to share the obligation with you and live up to their end of the bargain. All right, vendor contracts, third-party content, 24-7 telephone line. You know, there's plenty of cases out there that say it's not going to be enough. You know that. You heard that. You saw that. Um, but having an alternative means of reaching out, like maybe having a website, um, an email address at the bottom of an accessibility statement could be a good option because at least you're providing a way – uh, for people to find you and say, hey, I'm having issues with your website. I need help. And at the end of the day, what this really is about um, is offering your goods and services to everybody because a lot of times accessibility is good business because it increases your, you know, your, your, your market potential um, and you want to provide your goods and services to everybody and anybody that has an interest in them. Okay, So those are some high-level points. Ladies, do you have some, some additional points uh, to, to add to this? Not to this, but I'd be happy to touch on just a few tips for accessible features in the physical space. The, that was a good, that was a good uh, uh, reminder because I was going to forget about that. That's important. Julia, to you. All right. So I'm just going to breeze through the physical accessibility and maintenance piece that you guys probably are already familiar with if you're watching this. Um, basically, new construction and alterations to your physical spaces must comply with accessible design criteria, both the 2010 ADA standards, um, or if you're in California, be aware the California Building Code has some disparities compared to the 2010 ADA standards. Make sure you're following that. You've got to maintain um, the accessible features of your physical space. Um, you can have isolated or temporary interruptions in your service if you're doing maintenance or repairs, um, but otherwise, Maintain, make sure things are accessible. Next slide. Oh, real quick, CLE code time. I was reminded by one of our uh, uh, helpful participants that I forgot to read it, which I did. I told you all I would forget that. CLE code is SS, as in Seifarth Shaw, 1276. Again, the CLE code for this presentation is SS, Seifarth Shaw, SS, 1276. I'm also going to put it in the chat box. Continue, I apologize. Great, so next slide. Just a few tips. Make sure you've got accessible parking spaces and access aisles that are free of obstructions. Make sure you maintain your accessible routes. Make sure you know you trim your shrubs and your trees so that they aren't obstructing the routes. One important thing, make sure that you have self-service items like condiments, hand sanitizers, price scanners, water dispensers within accessible reach range. Um, you can see the, the sort of the actual requirements in this slide. You can look at it afterwards. Um, make sure that you've got accessible tables and an accessible bar counter. 5% um, of your seats, not 5% of your tables, need to be at an accessible table. All right. Well, there you go. Thank you, Julia. And we have our email addresses here. That, I guess, concludes the uh, narrative portion. Um, of our presentation. I've been answering questions as we go. We have like two minutes. So if you have a question, please put it in the Q&A box. We'll stand fast to answer your questions. Um, I also put the CLE code uh, in there as well. Um, we will be circulating a copy of the, the presentation for all of you. And if you're not comfortable or you don't have time to um, put a question into the, the question box, um, please reach out to any of us or all of us at the emails uh, below. Um, we're happy to answer questions, uh, follow up on anything, go into any uh, additional detail, uh, receive fan mail, or you love fan mail, so feel free to send us an email. Um, but with that, uh, hearing kind of no additional uh, questions, we'd like to thank all of you 
for your time and for your attention. It was a total privilege to be here and to present on these issues. And, uh, you know, stay tuned for uh, news coming out on our, on our blog uh, and future uh, uh, presentations from our ADA Title III team. We love doing these, and we love hearing from you. So thank you so much. Have a great day.